On May 5th, 1993, three boys, all eight years old, would go missing in West Memphis, Arkansas. Steve Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers were their names. It wouldn't take long for the bodies of these three boys to be found in a drainage canal on Robin Hood Hills. Their murders, coming at the height of the satanic panic, would be swept up in it. Soon, three teenagers were accused of this crime. Jesse Miss Kelly, Jason Baldwin, and Damian Eccles. All three would be convicted of the murder. Jesse Miss Kelly and Jason Baldwin would be sentenced to life in prison. Damian Eccles, to death. From 1994 to 2011, these men would be locked away for a crime they didn't commit, and a crime that Arkansas's judicial system would not reopen. So, a quick recap of what was going on at the time this crime happened. In 1980, Dr. Lawrence Pazder and Michelle Smith published a book called Michelle Remembers. Listed as a nonfiction book, it told the story of 14 months that Dr. Pazder, a psychiatrist, worked with Smith after she suffered a miscarriage. Smith, under what is implied to be hypnotherapy, claimed that at five years old, she was ritualistically by a satanic cult in Victoria, British Columbia. Going into graphic details of the horrors she went through, the book became a bestseller and was the beginning of the satanic panic, where people, businesses, music, everything would be accused of being satanic in some way, with the media fueling the fires of the panic. Police were trained to look for signs of not only satanic cults, but also rituals and ritual abuses in their areas. I bring this up at the beginning of this video because in my video on the beginnings of the satanic panic, which will be linked in the description, I mentioned Key McFarlane, a social worker who was swept up in the satanic panic, and how her actions almost sent people who worked at the McMartin preschool to prison for a crime they didn't commit. Well, in this one, you have something similar. A juvenile probation officer named Jerry Driver, who, like McFarlane, ended up getting swept up in the satanic panic. I say swept up, but Driver pretty much dove headfirst into it. Driver was a man in his 50s who, before becoming a juvenile probation officer, was a pilot. Driver became convinced that in the town of West Memphis, Arkansas, there was a satanic cult. He became obsessed with proving that, to the point that he, along with another probation officer named Steve Jones, would go into the woods during full moons to look for and stop satanic gatherings. Which they never found a thing. He considered himself an expert on satanic practices and was pretty popular with police, judges, and most town folk. But the creepy part of Jerry Driver was that he kept a list of names of teens that he believed were into devil worship. Three of them were Jason Baldwin, based off of his collection of heavy metal t-shirts and long hair, Jesse Miss Kelly, because he had spiked hair. Not kidding on that, he wrote, spiked hair and stuff. That's it. The only reason Miss Kelly was on there was because he had spiked hair. And Damian Eccles a kid that Jerry Driver knew really well. Eccles was a bit of a troublemaker and got in trouble with the law and ended up with Jerry Driver as his probation officer. And the more that Damien Eccles and Jerry Driver interacted, the more Driver became convinced that Damien was involved in a satanic cult. Before we get into the events that put these three in prison, it is important to get to know them a little. So I'm going to tell you about them and their upbringing, starting with Jesse Miss Kelly. Jesse Miss Kelly is one of the more tragic figures of this story. Jesse had the mind of a child. I'm trying to put this as PC as possible to gain favor from the YouTube overlords, but Jesse had an IQ of around 70. You wouldn't know it by looking at him, but he was intellectually disabled. He also had a bad huffing habit, which didn't help his brain, but he was the kind of guy who genuinely wanted to help others though he did have a temper and did get into fistfights. 
which comes to the myth of this story that he was friends with Baldwin and Eccles. In truth, he wasn't. Though he did live in the same trailer park as Baldwin and Eccles, he didn't hang out with them. He knew them well enough to say hi and that's it. In fact, he was scared of Damien Eccles. Jesse Miss Kelly was your typical good old boy who loved NASCAR and dreamed of being a pro wrestler. Jason Baldwin, on the other hand, was one of Damien's best friends. They liked the same music. They hung out all the time. And with Eccles, he was arrested for shoplifting and vandalism. There really isn't much on Baldwin, mostly because he was a good kid who hung out with more of a troublemaker in Eccles. He was a gifted artist and was going to go to college for graphic design. Damien Eccles is the one we have a lot of info on, mostly because of the books Life After Death and Almost Home, both being his autobiographies. Damien was born Michael Wayne Hutchinson. His name was changed to Damien after he asked for the name change. He wanted to change his name because he admired a priest. Father Damien was a priest in the Hawaiian Islands who took care of lepers until he contracted it himself. Damien admired Father Damien, so when he turned 13, he asked his name to be changed to Damien. His last name was changed to Eccles after his stepfather, Jack Eccles. He was raised dirt poor, sometimes living in a shack in the middle of a field, without indoor plumbing. And because of the area his childhood home was situated, it was constantly getting crop dusted by pilots and at risk of being burnt to the ground when farmers set fire to their fields to fertilize the ground. He wore all black because a girl told him that he looked cute in black. But he became interested in the occult, Wicca to be exact. And Damien tended to use this to his advantage to just scare people for the fun of it. And well, as much as he was misunderstood, he wasn't without his troubles. At 17, a girl broke up with him and he didn't take it well. He harassed the young woman, threatened to kill a guy she was hanging out with, then put his body in front of her house, then kill her, and set fire to the house. But all he ever ended up doing is getting into a fist fight with a guy his ex hung out with. That girl apparently found all this hot because later they hooked back up and attempted to run away together. And apparently, they both had pact, which according to Eccles, wasn't really that serious. Also, to make people uncomfortable, Eccles claimed that he was going to impregnate his girlfriend, and when the baby was born, the two got caught hanging out in a trailer that was abandoned, and thus began Eccles' trouble with the law and how he met Jerry Driver. As stated before, Jerry Driver thought himself a devil hunter. Eccles went to juvie, and there he was diagnosed as major depressive, to which later Eccles stated he was depressed because he was in juvie and had to deal with Jerry Driver. Also in juvie is where we get a sense of how completely insane Jerry Driver was. You see, while Eccles was locked away, Jerry had become convinced that Eccles was a witch. He came to this conclusion because once he searched Eccles' home and found a notebook Eccles labeled as the Book of Shadows. Inside was just a bunch of philosophical thoughts and gothic poetry. He also found books by Aleister Crowley, Stephen King, and Anton LaVey. So while Eccles was in juvie, Driver came to visit him, along with Stephen Jones, and they demanded Eccles do magic, which probably annoyed the hell out of Eccles, who was a smartass. Safe to say, Eccles highly disliked Driver, and Driver would not leave well enough alone. Eccles was just a kid, maybe a troubled youth, maybe things blown out of proportion, but Jerry Driver was a grown adult who thought that he needed to stop Satan from infesting the country. So he looked at Eccles like he was the devil himself. Even when Eccles moved to Oregon for a brief time, Driver wouldn't leave him alone. Driver called the local police station in Oregon and told them about Eccles. And how Driver felt that Eccles was a dangerous Satanist now living in Oregon. To the credit of the Oregon police, they ignored Driver. But not long after moving to Oregon, Eccles returned to West Memphis. This was after he was in a mental hospital after suffering a mental breakdown, in which he threatened to kill his parents. So he took a bus back to West Memphis. His parents had given up on him. When he got back to West Memphis, Jerry Driver was there waiting for him. Eccles had called his ex, and Jerry Driver got wind of it, so he showed up to arrest Eccles for breaking the terms of his probation. After Damien Eccles left Juvie for the second time, Driver continued to harass him. Eccles has admitted in his autobiographies that he was a dumb kid and troubled. He doesn't make any excuses for his actions here and what is to come. But these were their lives. Poor, living in a stuffy small town in the Bible Belt, and they all had dreams. All of them wanted to get out of West Memphis. 
but all three would, because of their past and because of the zealous nature of Jerry Driver, they would be accused of a greater crime. The biggest tragedy of this case is that three boys who were murdered have been overshadowed by how law enforcement and the judicial system completely messed up this case. And I want to take a moment before talking about the crime to talk about these three eight-year-old boys. Steve Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore. All three were eight years old. They all reached the rank of Wolf in the Cub Scouts. All three were best friends. Steve Branch was the son of Stephen and Pamela Branch. When he was an infant, his parents divorced, and Pamela would remarry a man named Terry Hobbs. He had a half-sister named Amanda, who was four at the time. He was an honor student. Christopher Byers was the son of Melissa DeFere and was adopted by her husband, Mark Byers. While Mark did use corporal punishment when Christopher acted up, the reports that he was abused are greatly exaggerated. Mark would spank Christopher with a belt, but not on bare flesh. That does not make it better, but Mark freely admitted to doing that, and Christopher did not have any behavioral problems. He was a typical kid who still believed in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Michael Moore was the only one of the three whose parents were still together. He was the son of Todd and Dana Moore. He was considered the leader of the three, a kid who loved being a scout as he would wear his uniform even outside of meetings. The three's parents would routinely tell them not to play in the area of Robin Hood Hills, a deeply wooded area that the three would secretly go to. According to Aaron Hutchinson, after school on May 5, 1993, he witnessed Michael Moore talking to a man in a maroon-colored car. The man was African-American, and according to Aaron, this stranger had told Michael that Michael's mother had asked him to pick Michael up to which Michael just walked home. At 5.30 p.m., Mark Byers would come home and find Christopher Byers doing chores in the yard. But at 7 p.m., Mark would call the police. His son had ADHD and was prescribed Ritalin. Christopher hadn't taken his medication yet, and so Mark went to inform him too. He went outside, but Christopher wasn't there. Rewind a bit to 6 p.m. Aaron Hutcherson was home with his mother Vicky. Michael Moore and Steve Branch had shown up to ask if Aaron could play in the woods with them. Vicky, who would become really important later, told the boys no and they left. Later on, Michael, Steve, and Christopher would be seen playing together, with Christopher riding on the back of one of the boys' bikes. Now back to Mark Byers. By 8 p.m., Officer Regina Meeks had showed up. But Regina Meeks would be called away shortly after because of another suspicious incident. More on that in a second. Terry Hobbs, Steve's stepfather, called him home to no answer. Terry went over to the Moore residence to see if Steve was there, only to find that neither boy was there. So Terry and Pamela, Steve's mother, drove around looking for him. They decided to go home and hope that he returned. Dana Moore met Terry Hobbs and Pamela at their residence where Terry and Dana returned to the Moore residence where they met up with Mark Byers. Soon search parties were formed to look through the woods at Robin Hood Hills. Through the night, the parents and volunteers searched the forest. But back to Regina Meeks really quickly. She had been called away at 8.42 to a local Mr. Bojangles. The location was a mile from the area the boys eventually would be found. A black male had stumbled out of nowhere, entered the ladies' room. He looked like he was bleeding, and he brushed up against the bathroom walls. He was mentally disoriented, and he had left before Regina Meeks made it there. Regina spoke to the manager through the drive through window. Regina never entered the restroom. She left without incident. On May 6, Detective Don Bray had scheduled an interview with Vicki Hutchinson. She worked at a truck stop near Robin Hood Hills, but she wasn't there to talk about the missing boys. Her employer had reported that she stole $200 from the establishment. She brought her son with her to the interview as she was worried for him due to his friends being missing. She did say in the interview that the kids had a clubhouse in the forest and gave information her son had given to help narrow the search. Don Bray excused himself to radio it in, but the answer he got back was to hold off on the information. The boys had been found. There's a lot to what happened to these boys that I cannot talk about. The reason is, it would either get the video age-restricted or just removed. So I am not going to talk about the state of the bodies, but I will give information that is important for later on. Steve Jones was one of the people who were looking for the boys. If you remember, he was a friend of Jerry Driver. In a drainage ditch, he spotted a black shoe. So he waded in, the mud so thick that it threatened to suck him under. 
He ended up disturbing the mud enough for the body of Michael Moore to float to the surface, and Christopher Byers and Steve Branch. All three were hogtied with their arms and ankles back. Christopher Byers had multiple lacerations and was missing a part of his anatomy. The three had been pinned under the water with sticks. In the creek, tied around sticks, were the boys' clothes. Before I go on, I am going to mention that the crime scene photos are in the documentary Paradise Lost, and they are haunting and disturbing. I am not going to show them, but I will say this before I continue further. It was just a murder. There was nothing found on the boys' bodies to indicate anything more than that. I'm trying really hard to inform everyone without going into gory details. This is not what this series is about. This series is about revealing true stories of those who were put in prison for crimes they didn't commit. So I'm going to say, if you want to look up the details, go ahead. I am not going to go into them. But I will say, when Steve Jones found the boys, the first thing he said was, well, it looks like Damien finally killed someone. Frank J. Peretti did the autopsy of the three boys. And while Peretti's autopsy findings would be debunked later, so I'm going to give you them here and then share what the other medical examiners thought so we can get past this disturbing part. For Christopher Byers, because of the lacerations and the missing part of his anatomy, Peretti concluded that he died from multiple injuries. For Michael Moore and Steve Branch, he concluded they died of drowning. He claimed during trial that a serrated blade found in a pond near Baldwin's residence could have been what caused the wounds on Byers. And experts refuted that. They were in the elements for close to 24 hours. Predation of wildlife happened. And while well, Byers' body happened to be the one that the wildlife found first. In truth, no one really knows how they died. This case was going cold and they needed a lead. So the officer who was investigating, Chief Inspector Gary Gitchell, was looking for any ideas. Don Bray reached out to his good friend, Jerry Driver, who pretty much stated this whole thing looked like a satanic ritual. Two days after the discovery of the bodies, police stopped by Jason Baldwin's trailer. Damien Eccles was there and the police began asking the two teens questions in the front yard. And this is where Damien proves the adage that when you are young, you're stupid. Because Damien had a habit of running his mouth and he should have stayed silent. And being silent is something he admits he should have done. Here are the highlights of what he told police. That whoever did it, it was a thrill kill. That the missing part of the anatomy is a symbol of power. And that he thought it was funny that the killer hadn't been caught and didn't care if the killer was ever caught. You know, typical edgelord shit. Oh, and later on, to scare some kids at a softball field, he said he killed the three kids and he was going to do it again. So yes, it is okay to see him as an asshole teenager. All of this put them in the crosshairs of the police. Oh, and Steve Jones is also an asshole. Peretti had told Steve Jones that he thought there had been urine found in the three boys' stomachs. It wasn't common knowledge, and the police kept that part secret. Steve Jones, on the other hand, didn't. Somewhere along the line, Steve Jones told Damien Eccles about it. So when police were questioning him and Baldwin on Baldwin's front lawn, Damien mentioned it. Damien stated that he heard about it from Steve Jones, and Steve Jones claimed he didn't tell anyone. So it's safe to say because of Steve Jones' lie, the police focused more on Damien. What also didn't help Damien is that on May 5th, a witness stated they had seen him with his pants covered in mud. But Damien would volunteer hair and blood samples, even took a polygraph test, which the records of which were never filed. Bill Durham, the person who administered the polygraph test, stated that in his opinion, Damien was lying. Nothing more, and while polygraph tests are inadmissible in court anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But I do have to point out, Bill Durham was the main person who did all the polygraph tests, and he was dog shit at it. So I'm not going to go into any more of the polygraph evidence. They have been highly disproven. But this is the point of the investigation that Gary Gitchell and other officers stopped looking at other suspects and focused on Damien Eccles and Jason Baldwin due to his association with Eccles. And the police would link Jesse Miss Kelly to this after help from Vicki Hutchinson. Vicki Hutchinson was called back in because of where she lived. She lived in the same trailer park as Baldwin, Eccles, and Miss Kelly. She was asked if she had heard anyone who was into satanic rituals. Vicky stated that she heard that a couple of kids in her trailer park were. And if you guessed those couple of kids were Jason Baldwin and Damian Eccles, you deserve a cookie. 
but with the approval of police, she decided to play detective, which led to her getting Jesse Miss Kelly involved. Jesse's name was on Jerry Driver's list, and Don Bray had shown Vicky that list. Vicky and Jesse knew each other because Jesse would sometimes babysit her kids. So she asked Jesse if he knew Baldwin and Eccles, which Jesse said that he did, but not really that well, which led to detectives asking Vicky to go deeper. She was to get Damien in her home and try to seduce him in order to get closer, and told her to get books on the occult from the library to put in her house so he sees them. So Vicky asked Jesse to talk to Damien, which Jesse, wanting to help someone he thought was a friend, did so. And here is what Vicky said happened at the time, but later recanted. I will tell you what she said really happened after I tell you this one part. Damien was impressed and invited her to an S-Bot, which is a pagan thing that I am not really sure how to describe. Well, she went with Jason Baldwin, Jesse Miss Kelly, and Damien Eccles in a car that should have been a red flag for law enforcement. Why? Well, the car type, none of the three owned, and Damien didn't know how to drive. And apparently people at this S-Bot were really edgy because they went by nicknames like Snake, Spider, and Lucifer. She got uncomfortable and asked Damien to leave, so he took her home. So now to what she later said happened that night. She got a bottle of liquor, got really drunk, doesn't remember what happened, woke up on her front lawn. But at the time, the police took this very seriously, and so they asked her to have Jesse stay with her so they can pick him up. Which she did, claiming fear of someone taking her kids. Jesse, again, was a guy who wanted to help others. And here is where we get into some of the horrific things the police did to get him to confess. Let's start with the fact that he didn't have a lawyer, wasn't read his rights, and didn't know he could have a lawyer present. They hooked him up to a polygraph machine, and then told him that the machine can tell when his brain lies. And then told him he was lying. This guy suffered so much because of this. He was even told that if he confessed, he can go home. But here is the most evil. Aaron Hutchinson was talked to by police before Jesse was brought in. The police took that recording and then ended up editing it to one sentence. That one sentence was Aaron saying, no one knows what happened to me. Gary Gitchell would play this from a hidden speaker in the room while interrogating Jesse Miss Kelly. This along with showing him graphic crime scene photos that scared Jesse badly. Jesse had an IQ of 70 to 72. He wanted to help people and this is how the police treated him. Oh, and it was after he agreed to confess due to these abuses of power that they decided to record the interview after 10 hours into the interview. So he would confess that he, along with Baldwin and Eccles, murdered the three boys, claiming his part was that he had to catch one of them as they tried to escape. If this all made you mad, get prepared because it is going to get much worse. The police coached him. Whenever he would get a detail wrong, they would correct him. And because Jesse had nothing to do with the murders, he was corrected a lot. The evidence in some of the statements he made before coaching didn't add up. For instance, he claimed that they abducted the children right after school, even though it is known that they went missing around 7 p.m. Another example, when he was asked what the boys were tied down with, he said row, and Gitchell corrected him saying that they actually were tied down with their own shoelaces. So how does this not scream that he did not do anything? With Jesse's confession, the police arrested Jason Baldwin and Damian Eccles at Baldwin's trailer, where the two teenagers were watching Leprechaun. Damien didn't take anything seriously, and well, he didn't exercise his right to remain silent. He would joke with Jason Baldwin, and he would be a smartass, which didn't help his case when it came to public opinion, and to Judge David Burnett, who, I have to admit, I have nothing nice to say after reading some of his dumbass takes. First, Barnett decided to read up on satanic rituals and the occult, and became convinced due to this and Damien's attitude that he was guilty. While Damien was a smartass, Jason Baldwin had a different take. Jason Baldwin thought there was no way God would allow him to go to prison for a crime he didn't commit. That is right, Jason Baldwin believed in God. He wasn't a goth kid, he wasn't a Wiccan, or a Satanist. He was just a normal kid. But the most heartbreaking was Jesse Miss Kelly. He had been told that if he confessed, he could go home. Well, he was lied to, and he waited for them to let him out. To the point that when he met his lawyer, he didn't know it was his lawyer. He also asked his lawyer what satin was showing the lawyer that Miss Kelly had no idea what was going on. 
Judge Burnett decided to try Miss Kelly alone, then Baldwin and Eccles together on a different date. So here is one of the things that Burnett ruled. The psychologists were not allowed to testify for the defense as he thought they were time consuming and not worth doing. I am not going to go over everything about this trial. I am looking at the script right now and realizing it is long. So I'm going to jump to the end because there is a lot left to cover. All three were found guilty of the murders of Steve Branch, Christopher Byer, and Michael Moore. Baldwin and Miss Kelly were sentenced to life in prison, while Damien Eccles was sentenced to death. With everything I just mentioned about this case and how police focused on three people over all other evidence, it didn't take long for people to realize things aren't what they seem. But before we get into that, let's talk about how the three did in prison. While Baldwin and Miss Kelly were pretty much okay, Damien had it the hardest. He was stuck in a cell and only allowed to go into a room where there was a skylight for an hour a day. In his cell, the previous occupant had drawn their outline on the wall, which he stated he didn't want to remove because it would mean that person would be gone. He was sitting in a cell waiting for death. It changed him. He went from a smart mouth goth kid to maturing. He realized that his attitude didn't help him in the slightest. In 1999, he tried to get a ruling that his defense counsel was incompetent. This was denied by Judge Burnett, who was the biggest obstacle for the three. I will get into that in new evidence, but spoiler, Burnett was a dick. In 1996, Lori Davis wrote to Damien. The two fell in love, and she became his rock. She quit her job in New York, moved to Arkansas, and began working on his case. The two were married in 1999 and had a child together. What caused her to be so interested was something that got their case more widespread. HBO presented a documentary called Paradise Lost, The Child Murders at Robin Hood Hills. This documentary is graphic. So graphic that I can't really talk much about it. There are crime scene photos in it showing the boys' dead bodies. But it was made to chronicle the events that led to the West Memphis Three's convictions. That was the first one, and it was insanely popular. There were two more made, Paradox Lost 2, Revelations, which mostly focused on Mark Byers, and it doesn't show him in a positive light, and Paradise Lost 3, Purgatory, which documents everything leading up to 2011. But Mark Byers and the families of the three boys all became convinced that Eccles, Baldwin, and Miss Kelly had nothing to do with the death of their children. Mark Byers was one one of the people Damien had offhandedly suggested killed the boys. But Damien apologized to Mark, and Mark became one of their biggest advocates. Yes, I'm on your side. I have no animosity for them. I have love in my heart for them. I have love and sympathy and empathy for their family, who I've made amends to. I'm looking for them today just to hug them, to let them know that they have their child back. Maybe I can't have my child back. But they're going to get theirs. He was one of many people trying to get the case opened back up. And some of those people trying to get that case opened back up happened to be friends in high places. If you're a fan of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, any song by Pearl Jam, or even movies by Johnny Depp, you helped in the struggle to get the West Memphis Three free. Peter Jackson took a lot of money he made from films he either produced or directed to make a documentary called West of Memphis. Johnny Depp, Pearl Jam, and Peter Jackson all spoke out on the innocence of Eccles, Baldwin, and Miss Kelly. All supported the legal efforts to get them free. But with every new evidence that was brought forth that these three were not the killers, Burnett would not be moved. Burnett and most of the judicial system in Arkansas believe that they have never put someone on death row that was not guilty of a crime. This is a huge issue for anyone in prison in Arkansas today, that even the judicial system will not admit to mistakes. But let's look at some of this new evidence, because some of it does get important later. Now before I begin this part, I'm going to say I am not going to claim anyone is guilty in this crime. I am not going to speculate on the guilt or innocence of any party. Sorry, I'm not going to. It is a sensitive case that at some point stopped being about the murder of three eight-year-old boys to trying to condemn three innocent people. So therefore, I'm not going to speculate on other suspects. Mark Byers comes up a lot in these accusations. He had given a cameraman a knife. That cameraman was named Doug Cooper. It ended up having blood on it that matched both Byers and Christopher, even though he had said they had never used that particular knife. 
which is circumstantial at best. Byers was a suspect for a while in a lot of these documentaries, until 2007, when DNA evidence ruled him out. A hair had been found on one of the bodies. In 2007, the hair was tested, and it had been found to have come from a black man. Now think back to the Mr. Bojangles incident, with a black man coming out of the forest and leaving blood all over the ladies' room. Here is why they cannot test it with that. After the bodies had been discovered by the police, the police did go back to that Mr. Bojangles to try to collect DNA. But the bathroom had been cleaned, so whatever DNA they did find, they just ended up losing anyways. It was because of this evidence that a request for retrial was submitted, but Judge Burnett blocked it, citing the tests were inconclusive, which actually, they were not inconclusive. They were able to prove the hair belonged to a black man, a different race from Eccles, Baldwin, and Miss Kelly. So it was taken to the Supreme Court of Arkansas, who ruled in favor of a retrial. And luckily, David Burnett was no longer a judge. By the way, David Burnett became a state senator and was a Democrat. Just goes to show you that it isn't the political party that makes the dumbass. It is the dumbass that chooses which political party to associate with. David Laser replaced him. But this wouldn't go to retrial because the Arkansas judicial system had to save face so the three were offered a deal. An Alfred plea is the dumbest thing I have ever read. But here it is in a nutshell. A defendant in a criminal case does not admit to the criminal act and asserts innocence, but admits that the evidence presented by the prosecution would be likely to persuade a judge or jury to find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So for the three to go free, if they agree to take Alfred pleas, they would go free which means the case will never be opened up again to find the real killer. It would mean the three would technically admit guilt while stating they are innocent. The three decided to do it. They wanted to be free, and their decision came down to Damien. Jesse Miss Kelly was for it. Jason Baldwin wanted to take his chances in court, but changed his mind when he realized Damien, if they lost, would end up dying by lethal injection. So they took the deal, and they were set free. Baldwin and Eccles' friendship strained, and they haven't talked in years. But Jason Baldwin has a Facebook page. He is also the co-founder and deputy director of Proclaim Justice, which is a foundation dedicated to help free the wrongfully convicted. Links to the page will be in the description. Eccles himself left Arkansas for New York, never to go back. In fact, he lived in Peter Jackson's guest house for a time. Jesse Miss Kelly lives a quiet life. Not sure where he is, but I hope he's doing well. The only thing I could find of him was a tweet from 2017 with a mugshot. Apparently, he had been arrested for driving without a license and proof of insurance. Damien Eccles has a YouTube channel where he discusses magic and his Wiccan beliefs. He also has a Twitter. He wears shades a lot of the time, but not to be cool. The reason is, his eyes cannot handle light anymore due to his time in prison. He has advocated for the Robin Hood Hills murders to be reopened. Not to clear his name, but to bring closure to the families. All who stood by him and supported him. Damien went from a smart-mouthed asshole kid to a mature adult with nothing but kindness. It is an amazing turnaround. But lost in all of this are Steve Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers. Three young boys who were brutally murdered who, due to the judicial system of Arkansas, their case remains unsolved, and most likely will never be solved. 